if I can do couldn't get through the day without yeah. hearing from you. So I'm, I'm glad you were willing to do that. I want to lift up our scripture today and our scripture lesson comes to us from Isaiah. And it's Isaiah chapter 43. Uh, and it's uh, verses 1 to 7. Uh, and it's a very beautiful text. Uh, it reads as this way. If you look at the Pew Bible, you can find it on page 623 of the Pew Bible. It reads in this way. It says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, people in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you 
I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. May God add a blessing to the reading of those words. If you would join me in a moment of prayer, we come to you, O Lord, now and ask that you just open our hearts and minds to be able to perceive and receive what you're saying to us. One thing is always certain, Lord, and that is that you are the potter, we are the clay. Yeah. So mold and shape us as you would have us to be until we are perfectly fitted for your kingdom and able to call ourselves disciples of Jesus the Christ. Now, as we come to this teaching time, you hone it, you develop it, you shape it, you send it forth as you see fit, allow it all to be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 And, uh, my, my message teaching today is on the subject Africa, Jews, and the Biblical Narrative. Africa, Jews, and the Biblical Narrative. Now, this text is beautiful with its words of assurance and hopefulness. The presence of the Lord is affirmed through thick and thin, through trials and tribulations, and through the difficulties of living into good and better times. You hear the words of the text. They assure the listener. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. Yeah. Now, the historical setting of these texts here in Isaiah is while people are in exile in Persia or in Babylon. That's the setting of this text. And so the ears that are hearing this text are hearing it from a place of being in exile feeling at some times that maybe God is not present. Mm. Feeling at times that, why would I be way out here all by myself, all alone? Feeling at times, you know how I can feel. We can feel in exile, even well, surrounded by a folk well, that we know. But here they are feeling that maybe I fooled myself. Maybe the God I thought was present was not the God that was present. Maybe somehow I've been left alone to deal with my own devices. Maybe if, it, if God was here, Maybe God is no longer here. And the words of Isaiah rings out with strength in response. It rings out in such a way it says to hold on, even when you're feeling alienated, to hold on All right. through the lonely times. Hold on through the hard and difficult times. Yeah. The, the, the poetry of, the, of, of, of this passage in Isaiah comes out. It says, if you pass through waters, I'll be with you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. The text is speaking to people that need to hear it, desire to hear it, and want to feel enfolded in the comfort of God. But as I push us to think about it, what caught my eye in this text was not so much the reassurance of the text, it's there, but what caught my eye in this text is the reference that God has paid a ransom for the people in exile. God has paid a ransom to redeem the Jews in captivity in Persia. The text says, I give Egypt as your ransom, mm. Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. Well. Now I find myself asking, why would God give up Africa for people in exile in Babylon? Because that's what is being stated here, that I give up Africa for the folks who are in exile in Babylon. Why would God assert that he has paid Egypt and Cush and Nubia and Seba as a payment to release from captivity the people, the relatively small group of people in exile in what is today Iran and Iraq. Why should these places in Africa be singled out? Now, now I would suggest to you that what we find in this text is an attempt to recenter the geographical nucleus of Judaism. Basically saying, I, I give this up for this year. 
And, and, and it's making this statement because obviously there's some tension that is going on in terms of where is God, where, who has God spoken to, who is God in the midst of, where do we find God, yeah. right? The, uh, 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 those, those, those who are in exile are saying, we, we, we need to find God here. Uh, but God exists in another place. And so the writers, we've got to remember, you know, God didn't swoop down and take out a pen and write this. Mm. This is somebody's interpretation of what God's spirit is doing at a particular time in history. And so, and so we look at this text with those kinds of eyes, realizing that you have a theologian or a writer, somebody who is spiritually inclined, somebody who feels that they have a relationship with God, knowing and feeling and believing that somebody needs to hear a word from God. Well, yes, so they write it in a particular way in order to communicate it. But what we realize in this text is that there's probably a tension, a geographical tension. Where is Judaism? That maybe Judaism was rooted in the core of Africa and, and migrated and spread northward across continents. Mm. Maybe the genesis of Judaism actually takes place on the continent of Africa. I know we don't used to think in that way. But that is the reality when you look at the text. Uh, a, a, a scholar, Gert Miller, in the book Eden and the Biblical Garden discovered in East Africa contends that the story of the place of creation is geographically pinpointed on the continent of Africa. Mm. Now the Garden of Eden is described in Genesis as having been near a four river system in the region of Cush, Havilland, and Ashur, which today would be near the borders of Eastern Sudan, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. Right? Lewis and, 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 and Mary Leakey, some of y'all might remember that name, right? And, uh, discovered in, in, in Tanzania uh, fossilized bones. At that point, 1959, believed to be one of the oldest discoveries of human bones, or what would, the, what would basically evolve into, into human bone, into a human being. Uh, found in Odevai Gorge. And then since then, in 74, in Ethiopia, there were bones that were found that was even older. And as people looked at that, uh, and particularly with the work of Leakey, you remember how people responded to Mary, uh, the Leakeys, right? They, they basically wanted to reject the scholarship. Why would you want to reject the scholarship? Because for a lot of the, the European institutions, educational institutions, it was the idea that it was preposterous that Humanity should come off of the continent. Well. Who would think such a thing? Because obviously uh, uh, it had to exist somewhere else. And again, it was because of really the, the, the Eurocentric perspective in, in terms of understanding how the world works and, 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 and what are the signs of origin. But when we look at it, we really realize that, that, that if humanity comes out of Africa, then also some of the oldest religions also flows out of Africa with those with, with humanity. All right. Now, science and the Bible are often perceived as being with, at odds with one another. But science and the Bible may agree that life and religion originated from that continent that we know as Africa. Only love, Austin wrote in Sojourner's Magazine, a while back, these words. It says, it is difficult to see the black presence in the Bible because you won't read the terms like black or African, but you will read the terms Ethiopians, Cushites, Egyptians, Hebrews, or other tribal terms. Ethiopia is mentioned 45 times in the text. Add this to the number of times Egypt is mentioned. And Africa is mentioned more than any other land mass in the Bible. It should also be noted that the Middle East, including the Holy Land, was connected to Africa until 1859 when the Suez Canal was completed and had been referred to Northeast Africa for the majority of modern history. So, you know, there's no such thing, in other words, as a Middle East. A Middle East gets carved and labeled 
something else because you basically build a canal for commerce uh, that breaks through the Red Sea uh, trying to connect the Mediterranean. Yeah. Right? So all of a sudden, you know, people, it's just like, just look at it this way. For those of you who are in D.C., uh, all of a sudden you got a nomad. <laughs> right? Yeah. right? I, I'm, riding, I'm riding the metro one day and it goes, no, 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 I go, what? No, what? Right? Yeah. right? I mean, all of a sudden the distinction of a new neighborhood just created out of nothing, out of nowhere. Right? So, so it happens. Uh, people begin to geographically mess with things for a whole lot of different reasons. Sometimes out of the need to be a, a, a supreme to somebody else. To create these types of classifications. Yeah. Well. In, in fact, the names of tribes, and the names of descendants of figures in the scripture, it goes back to African identification. You know, very often we read Genesis with fundamentalist eyes. But in fact, Genesis exists symbolically, almost as, 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 as biblical myth. And, and myth used in this case to get at larger truth. Like, for example, Adam is not a man. Adam is Adam, which means humankind. Right? And, and, and so if you look at it, God creates humankind. Right? But, but we get caught up in sort of this idea of personifying uh, uh, a, a concept. Uh, and so we miss somewhat of the nuances that are in the text. For example, if you look at the text, Cush, according to scripture, is the oldest son of Ham. But Cush is a region in Africa. Cushites are a people in Africa. And Ham is a son, as you know, of Noah, according to the text. Cush was the brother of Canaan, which is, again, a geographical area, and Canaanites, a ethnic people. And he was the brother also of Mishraim. Mishraim meaning Egypt. And Put, meaning Libya. According to Genesis, Cush has sons, and those sons are Seba, which is, again, an African tribe. Havila, Sabta, Rama, and Sabtekcha, all ethnic groups in Africa. Some of them Cush, some of them Nubians. All African regions and people. Even Jeremiah, in chapter 13 of Jeremiah, verse 23, rhetorically asks this question. He says, can Ethiopians, or in other translations it says, can Cushites, in other translations it says, can Nubians change their skin or leopards their spots? Now this certainly suggests that there was something about the color of the skin that made the Ethiopians, the Cushites, and the Nubians different than the writer even of Jeremiah. But to know the scriptures is to know this extremely close connection between peoples and nations in Africa and the religion laid out in the Bible. For example, we study the scriptures closely, we discover that many of the Hebrew patriarchs married or had children with women from African tribes, which would strongly suggest that those patriarchs were African themselves. Abraham had children with Hagar and Keturah, both from African or Hamitic tribes. Moses married Zipporah, who was Ethiopian. Jacob had children with two handmaidens from African tribes, and these children became the patriarchs of two tribes of Israel. I'm stating this to state that as life appears to have evolved from the continent of Africa, so it is that Judaism evolves from the continent of Africa. What we know as Judaism emerges out of the African continent, and like human beings, it migrates from the continent, offering strength and hope to the world. If you look at Amharic, which is the language of Ethiopia, there's been a strong linguistic suggestion that the, the script, the Ethiopian script, the Amharic, resembles archaic Hebrew. Right? And, and, and of course, we know that there's this continued relationship for whatever reason that is cited numbers of times in the scripture between what gets later known as Israel and 
Ethiopia. And so we see the emergence of this. And you know, the fact is, is that we often don't want to think or know or nobody teaches us about the African roots of what it is that we believe. And it's not to put anything else down or anybody else down, but it really talks about sort of this, this, this migratory root of, of humanity and also this migratory root of the faith as it moves forth in, in, into the world. And so it's not something to be looked down upon. It's something to understand. In, in fact, I, I was talking at the 8 o'clock service, and I was saying that every time I go down to the church and rest, I have one person in the congregation from God. And, and I'm always interested in what she has to say. And the reason I have an interest in what she has to say, because I'm always asking myself, did, did her cultural tradition come first and the scripture second, or the scripture came first and her cultural tradition second? I remember one time we were talking about David and, and, and David and Bathsheba and their child not being named. Because, and, and I said, so, you know, they didn't name the child because the child died. And so, of course, Rose said, well, in our tradition, you don't name a child until after a certain amount of days have passed mm -hmm. in order to know whether that child really belongs to the spirit world or really is yours given into this world. And then after that period, then you name the child. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so it's things like that that sort of began to catch me and began to cause me to just inquire deeper where all of these things may come from. Where, where do they all originate from? Yeah. And, and, and therefore, to, to, to really begin to understand ourselves and our roots and, 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 and the songs that, that continue to move with the scripture. So what is often the case is the world the values that we have devalued even in our faith tradition in Africa. And much of that devaluation is based on skin color. And therefore, here in this Isaiah text, there is an attempt to divorce the faith from God, who is in one place, and bring God to another place while devaluing and getting rid of the other place. Mm -hmm. But you know, I look at this and I, I, I sort of rejoice in the study. But I know one thing. I know that this word here in this text, no matter what is going on, it still calls out. It still calls out through the eons. It still calls out from the mists of history. It still feeds the soul. Uh, it, it still lifts up spirit and it gives strength. So whether these scriptures and texts are from the African context, which I believe they are, it still gives hope and strength and carriage to the whole world, yeah. and particularly those who sit in darkness, particularly those who sit in places of being disempowered, particularly those who feel exile. It gives us strength in order to run on just a little bit further. Yeah. I can see why people would want to appropriate the power of these scriptures, because it has sustained people throughout the times. It has sustained people with its poetry, with its concepts, it has sustained people with its spirit. These texts, no matter whether in Africa or in Persia, is food for the soul, and it's a healing of our hearts. It says here, it says, do not fear, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, who I formed and made. You see, it's no matter where these words came from, it still feeds the soul. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it still feeds the soul. Uh, it is important to realize, however, when we begin to look at these scriptures, particularly from our perspective, sitting here, wherever we're sitting at, in the snowstorm, is that we begin to realize that we are the Hebrews in this text. We are the Jews in this text. 
It is important to understand that we are the people of the text from antiquity, evolving into the people of Jesus. We are the people of the call of God, set apart and chosen. And we are the people of the Christ, bringing openness and light into the world. We are the people of Cush and Nubia and Seba and Egypt. And we are the people of Bethlehem. We are the people of God the Creator, and we are the people of Jesus the Christ. We are being challenged to see ourselves in this very universal context. For we are here, but also our souls rest with the drumbeats of Africa, as folks called out these psalms and songs that went into Scripture. We're there, and we're here at the same time. We find that our waters, our roots have been watered in that continent, and we find out that it's still relevant for our stats and our work and our going forward right here today in North America. We are challenged to see ourselves in the context of the scripture, and these scriptures still speak to our soul. Amen. 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 Since we're small, we do something in wrestling since we're small down there, a little bit less formal, and that is for people to have a word, respond to that text, respond to the sermon, criticize it if you want. Right? I mean, it's all about sort of being able to dialogue together, so feel free if that's you to lift up a comment, a word, something maybe you thought of, right? something maybe didn't make sense, whatever. I told Reverend Robinson that uh, I, I was very, when I saw uh, what you might be talking about this morning, I said, I got to get out here to get to church because I'm going to hear about this. <laughs> the African roots of, 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 of uh, Christianity and uh, faith that I believe in is uh, something that really makes, it makes me feel more powerful and more uh, able to uh, cope with a lot of things, because uh, if I don't have that, then I don't have, I don't have God. I, I mean, I, I, and, and if I do have that, I have God on my side, wherever I am. So, uh, it's a hard sermon to preach, and, and you brought it out very nicely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Amen. 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 And let us prepare for our communion.
pray. Dear me, Father, we just thank you for this invitation to this, your Lord's table. You have opened up this table to all that believe in you, so we just thank you. We just lift up this bread which represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that went to a cross that we can have life and have life more abundantly. We also lift up this cup which represents his blood, the sign of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. May we take and eat of this bread, may we take and drink of this cup, and do a remembrance of Jesus our Christ, the one who loves us, saves us, and redeems us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 On the day in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks for it, he took it and broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Each time that you take of it, do it in remembrance of me. And likewise, I remind you to remember all of those whose bodies have been broken in the struggle for justice and for freedom and for liberation. We don't forget them, and we do not forget our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was also on that same evening that he took the cup. And again, after he had given thanks for it, he said, this is my blood blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins and for the creation of a new society. Each time that you take of it, do it in remembrance of me and likewise I remind you to remember all of those who shed their blood in the struggle for justice, freedom and liberation. We shall not forget them. We shall not forget our Lord and Savior Jesus. You're invited to share in this communion. We ask uh, Table will serve you. We ask that you hold the communion so that we can all take the communion together. told me to bend it down and pull it up. <laughs> you have trouble. <laughs> bend this flat down and up. It worked. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Take and eat this and do it in remembrance of Jesus. I need another one.
take and drink this and do it in remembrance of Jesus our Christ. Let us join together in the prayer that we were taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed to be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever. Invite us to stand as we prepare to return from our work. It is so good to see everybody today on this Amen. snowy day. Be safe, whatever you're going to do the rest of the day. And uh, I have to admit, I'm, I, I like to drive in snow. So, <laughs> so I'm one of those strange creatures. But I was, I was explaining, I said that it had to do when I left Baltimore. Uh, I ended up in Chicago. And y'all know how it snows in Chicago. And then I went from Chicago to Boston. So it didn't get any better, right? So by the time I came here, I had been seasoned with the snow. Right? So I rejoice in it. And I rejoice in all the seasons. So, Lord, we want to thank you today thank for just you. blessing us, bringing us together. Thank you, Lord, today. For filling our hearts. Thank you, Lord, today for allowing us to be together as your people in this house of worship. Yes. And, Lord, as we go forth from here, surround us with your protection, your comfort, and your care. And allow us to be light in the midst of the world, to bring hope and joy into some place that needs to have it. Use us today as instruments of your hope and salvation. In all these things we pray in the name of the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Yeah. 